Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar as the final of our 2021 analytical extravaganza. I'm Heather Jeswa, a senior field sales engineer at Shimatsu Scientific Instruments. I'll be your moderator today, and we will hear from Dr. Scott Hamilton Brem, and our talk title is Subsurface Microbiology Metabolism by HPLC. And you might notice our moderator was listed as Matthew Shides, and our thoughts and prayers go out to he and his family. Before we start, I wanted to share a couple of notes for our viewers. The webinar console has a variety of items to help enhance your experience and interaction with us. In the screen, you'll see the following items. The slides will appear on the left-hand side. Directly under the slides, you will see a resource list with clickable links relevant to the material being presented today. On the top middle is the widget for questions and answers. Please submit your questions during the presentation through this widget, and we will answer them during the Q&A session following the presentation. Just below the Q&A box are the moderator and speaker bios. You may expand the items here to learn more about us. On the right are survey questions that you may fill out any time during or after the presentation. Finally, at the bottom pane are the icons to bring up all these widgets in case they are minimized or hidden. All right, without further ado, let's get started. Again, if you're just joining us, I'm Heather Jeswa, your moderator. Today we'll be hearing from Dr. Scott Hamilton Brem, and our top talk title is Subsurface Microbiology Metabolism by HPLC. Scott Hamilton Brem received his bachelor's degree from Cal Poly in St. Louis Obispo, in, where he studied bacteria inside the abdomen of prehistoric bees trapped in amber. He worked for the biotech company Promega Biosciences for four years before returning to academia. He received his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. At UGA, he studied the model hypothermophilic Archaeon, pyrococcus, furiosis, and how it reacted to iron sulfur nitrogen based antibiotic molecules. He discovered his talent and skill of culturing thermophilic microorganisms, and this skill set led him to work as a postdoc at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. At Oak Ridge, he worked for the Bioenergy Science Center, whose mandate was to research the application microbial mediated consolidated bioprocessing to generate biofuels. Afterwards, Scott was part of the Division of Earth and Ecosystem Sciences at the Desert Research Institute in Las Vegas, where he studied and cultivated strict anaerobic thermophilic microbial communities from the deep subsurface of the Southern Nevada Desert. Now he is part of the Microbiology Department at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, where he is continuing his research into culturing deep subsurface microbes and bacterial-driven biofuel production. During the beginning of the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, Chicago was fighting against becoming a new hotspot for the virus. Testing in Illinois slowed when the availability of viral transport medium became strained. The governor of Illinois made an emergency call to university researchers to make the viral transport media in an effort to protect the state's citizens. Scott's lab rallied, pulled support from other departments of the microbiology and zoology, in Carbondale to answer the governor's call. Professors and student volunteers together produced 115,000 vials of the viral transport medium for the state of Illinois in just over two months. With that, I'll hand it over to Scott. Hi, um, my name is Scott uh, Hamilton Bream. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Southern Illinois uh, University Carbondale. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some of my work with subsurface microbiology and um, tracking uh, metabolism uh, using uh, East Bay City. And uh, okay, so to um, give, give you a little background about my lab, I um, uh, started uh, about five years ago. I'm actually I'm up for tenure uh, uh, this year. Um, my 
original interest in microbiology has been the extreme and unusual microorganisms that you find uh, out there in the world. And um, but also, I, I started working with like uh, microarrays uh, initially, and uh, but also I was always still very good with computers. So I was trying to find a way to be able to kind of combine multiple worlds together. And so isolation characterization of novel microbes uh, kind of takes me into uh, multiple uh, realms. So one of freshwater and marine environments um, from, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, algae blooms uh, in uh, uh, freshwater lakes to even um, squid, uh, marine squid uh, found in uh, Hawaii. Um, also, from freshwater systems, you may have remediation problems, such like acid mine drainage, uh, for example, or even uh, radionuclides. Um, and then, so this is where I get to bring in the computers on it. So I, I, I build computers to be able to help me assemble um, large data sets. So the you know, big data and all that good stuff. Um, but um, I'll talk specifically about like what I, one of the things I need to do a lot in my uh, lab, which is assemble genomes to get the large data sets to close the genome so I can use that as a tool to be able to, I can, so I can, can characterize uh, novel microbes. And then the subsurface. Um, the, while in microbiology we pay a lot of attention to the surface, the, uh, and you know, we know uh, a few things about that, but even though we're a little bit at a disadvantage, in the deep subsurface, it's even worse. We know very little about these microbes down there. They are essentially cut off from the surface. So how does that work? And, and so that's where you know, I'm trying to understand the metabolism becomes key. Okay, so um, when, I, when I say subsurface, um, I, I have to define this. Because to, depending on you know, who you talk to, subsurface could be you, know, you take a shovel and you dig a hole in the ground and you know, that, that's subsurface. Um, for intents and purposes, when I talk about subsurface, I'm talking about uh, environments that are 500 meters or more under level surface. Now, of course, uh, you know, there's elevation differences, and then there's sea level and, and stuff like that. I understand. But for um, samples I'm dealing with, they're coming from terrestrial sites, and these sites are um, usually um, pre, you know, much deeper than just the um, surface uh, 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 areas uh, influenced by the sun and water, meteoric water, and stuff like that. So these very deep areas are cut off. From the surface, and so the microbes that you find in these environments are very interesting because then usually they either have interesting new genes or they have to make uh, relationships with each other that are uh, strange, uh, sustaining, and interesting to maintain carbon and energy levels. So you know, just that just kind of you know uh, define like so when, when I say subsurface, this is what I mean. Okay. Um, yes, uh, when we talk about microbiology, I don't bring up the great plate count anomaly. So um, this is basically you know, the tip of the iceberg where when we observe microbes out in the environment, we're only able to grow about one to eight percent of that it could be uh, you know, uh, grown in the lab, uh, cultured uh, repeatedly and reliably and so forth. That leaves a vast majority of microbes out there that we are not growing um, and we really uh, have no control over more understanding of them. Now with bioinformatics, sequencing and all that, that has changed things, but we have this disconnect where we'll have bioinformatic information of a microbe, but we won't have a grown organism in the lab. And sometimes, and then vice versa, sometimes we'll just have the grown uh, organism and we'll have no sequence information. So um, that leaves, uh, at least on the surface, a vast majority of them that, uh, of microbes that we do not have a, a grown representative uh, for. Um, through sequencing, we'll know that there are certain uh, metabolisms or certain uh, uh, specialized uh, niches, such as like Animox or AOM, um, so, uh, different uh, nitrogen and uh, methane cycling. And, um, but there's also a, uh, microbes that we 
don't have names for, they, they are uncharacterized, uh, un, uncultured. This is the microbial dark matter. Again, all this that I've just mentioned is all surface centric. Um, when you deal with the subsurface, it gets even worse. We have, there's, I think in the JGI database, there's um, really only uh, a dozen or so genomes or microbes there that are truly subsurface. The vast majority is very surface centric. So we don't have living representatives, uh, grown or even sequenced representatives of subsurface, at least not, not in the real sense that we do have for the surface. So um, definitely from my lab's perspective on it, this is um, not only a disadvantage, this is pretty much crippling. And so um, we have made it a point to start growing as many uh, isolating and growing as many subsurface microbes as we can, the novel microbes, and then sequence them, close the genomes, and then uh, uh, characterize their metabolism and try to figure out what their role is in their environment. Okay, so here I want to just kind of show, so of the organisms that are out there that are available for scientists to do research, they're coming from, you know, oil wells, water boreholes, uh, geothermal heating systems, gold mines, and so forth. The access to these organisms is very limited because of the access to the subsurface. You only get a chance of getting into these areas or is one of these uh, um, means. There are, you know, if you look at uh, geothermal hot springs, like you can look at them as windows to the subsurface, but it's also very challenging to be able to collect a sample, a discrete sample that is not contaminated in some way from the surface, either through water or equipment or whatever. So um, it, by far, it is very challenging to acquire a, uh, a, a true pristine sample that have microbes that are coming from the deep subsurface. I'm going to focus on two microorganisms that I have in my lab coming from the Death Valley Regional Flow System, and this is a part of my work that I had done at Desert Research Institute under the mentorship of Dwayne, uh, Dr. Dwayne Moser, but now I'm, I'm pursuing it further in my lab here at SIU. So um, one of the things I've, uh, in my experience of growing uh, extremophiles and, and focusing on subsurface microbes, um, you want to have a kind of a strategy to be able to grow these microbes and, and knowing that no one method is going to work and so you kind of have to build up a, a repertoire of different uh, techniques and methods and, uh, and so forth. Um, for, for at least for this talk here, I want to talk about um, short-chain uh, short fatty acids or uh, very simple uh, carbon molecules such as septonic acid or malic acid, humor, uh, fumarate, uh, xylitol, and so forth. So for I guess for whatever reason, but I mean, this might be a clue in itself, is that these molecules help greatly in my technique to be able to grow and isolate microbes. Um, I, you know, probably I'll have to start coming up with other uh, uh, techniques, but right now with just this, these handful of molecules here, um, you're practically guaranteed with a, a, a very diverse and uh, rich uh, uh, a group of microbes from any environment. These environments are also very uh, highly reduced. They're also very anaerobic. Um, so um, the conditions are need to be very stringent. I, I, most times, I, the dissolved oxygen needs to be zero. Um, even a smidgen of uh, oxygen is enough to cause a culture to uh, just not perform or not grow correctly. Um, the reductive potential is also important. So, um, it, you know, negative 300 to 400 millivolts is almost necessary. If you're at negative 200, that can also affect what you're going to grow at, uh, uh, as far as microbes on the subsurface. Your water choice. I usually have to use distilled water. You, you have to avoid certain water sources because there's just some sort of uh, basal chemical, um, either from plastics or whatever that affects these. These subsurface microbes are very fussy, very fastidious. So it's not a, a straightforward uh, method of saying add water, add nutrients, 
throw them, and that's it. So um, it's a very frustrating, long, tedious work, but um, I, hopefully the organisms are going to share with you um, all uh, all that frustration and uh, long time is worth it because uh, we, uh, in the end, uh, my lab has been able to um, grow some very interesting microbes from the deep subsurface. So I'm going to talk about uh, two different sites, and these are actually these are sites that I worked on as a postdoc when I was at Desert Research Institute. And this was under a, a program that uh, Dr. Dwayne Moser had started. But um, the water samples that, I, uh, that were collected from these areas, um, I used to isolate or enrich and then isolate uh, novel microbes that I started studying, and then I have brought over here to SIU, and I've continued the work. These um, two sites, um, U3C and number five and BL1, are um, spatially very far apart from each other, but they have some similarities. Um, they're uh, both geothermally heated, they are drilled into dolomite, and, uh, and uh, anaerobic water uh, it, it found in these different areas hosts a very diverse, very uh, rich community of uh, subsurface microbes. And both these sites are over uh, 500 meters uh, um, below the surface. So I don't want to spend too much time on the, the, the kind of the geochemistry of the site, but some of these sites are very unique and very strange, like such as U3C and number five or the Bilby site. It's actually a borehole drilled right next to an atomic detonation. Um, but it was under the water table, and there was no you know, radiation or anything like that. It's actually a very uh, closed-off system, but it was the water was uh, heated as around 45 degrees Celsius, pH is around uh, 7.6 to 8, you know, and um, very re uh, uh, reduced uh, lack of oxygen and, um, and lack of nutrients. So from this environment, uh, uh, my, uh, I was able to in, uh, isolate a new genera of uh, microbes. So um, this work, I, I this is my some of my postdoc work I did at a Desert Research Institute. The new organism that I identified, um, I gave it a strain name DRA13, um, and it was a brand new genus under the family Peptopicacea. And uh, morphology was actually kind of interesting because when I was doing the enrichment, nothing else grew except for this very long rod. And um, at the time, I was using um, a pro uh, peptides, I believe, and eventually I shifted over to fumarate. And um, this organism um, was new, novel to the uh, uh, other characterized organisms, but interesting enough, by the 16S, the uh, full length 16S, uh, when compared to other uh, uh, entries, the, all the other organisms that were similar to this were all found in uh, Danish heating system subsurface environments. So it was very encouraging to see that this organism seemed to only be found in subsurface environments, that there hadn't been any other uh, sightings of it uh, on the surface. So from the initial uh, enrichment and isolation, um, we start sequencing the uh, genome. And the first round, we used an Illumina um, system uh, platform, and we got about 1858x coverage of it and came up with a, uh, several uh, contigs, I think it was MIBA 12 or something like that, um, at 3.6 megabases and about 3,700 uh, open reading frames. So that was from the initial, initial characterization uh, paper. Then just recently, um, we published a new paper on this organism where we, uh, my students, used Oxford nanopore uh, sequencing and start combining, uh, did a hybrid assembly and was able to close the genome uh, to uh, finalize it as 3.8 megabases and 4,000 uh, ORFs. Now, just again, notice that no one system or sequencing method is the end all. Because you know, we used the Illumina and we, while we had a coverage around 1800X, we still couldn't close it. With the long reads from the nanopore, we were able to close it, but we couldn't do it just with the nanopore. So the hybrid assembly was essential for us to get this 
uh, picture of uh, this uh, sequenced uh, genome of this organism. So now we have the organism cultured in the lab. We can grow it, and we have a very good copy of the genome. So from the genome, um, in our recent paper, we revisit looking at the metabolism, trying to figure out, okay, when I originally grew this organism, I could only grow it on fumarate. Um, you know, you go with what works, right? So fumarate is what you're going to grow on, then that's what you're going to use. But it, it's kind of counterintuitive. I mean, you're a deep subsurface microbe, and if, uh, if it's a ligotrophic down there, it's not a lot of energy, you probably want to kind of keep your options open. You want to be an opportunistic microbe and pick up uh, lots of different carbon and energy sources. So we started looking at the genome and trying to say, okay, what about transporters? What other things could I have used to grow this microbe to uh, sustain it? And so we did find, say, transports for lipopolysaccharides, uh, poly uh, polysaccharides, branched amino acids. And so we started going down the list, trying all these different things that the by the annotation said they should have the transporters for and should work. Nothing worked. So that was kind of an interesting you know, clue to try to understand these subsurface microbes. At least for DRI-13, it was very specialized for fumarate. So if that's the case, then we should be able to track fumarate using uh, instruments such as an HPLC. And um, we found other, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but we did find some other genes such as, you know, uh, CRISPR arrays, uh, repair mechanisms, even uh, bifurcating hydrogenase. So everything kind of fit together that, okay, this microbe is very specialized. May not, maybe it has uh, some sort of uh, uh, commensal or communal uh, relationship with other microbes down there, but we're just focusing on this right now. And it does grow on fumarate, so we should be able to use this to track its uh, metabolism. So this is the uh, uh, work that we did in the original paper to characterization, where in the genome we could find genes for fumarate uh, fermentation or uh, respiration. And so that was, again, an encouraging, okay, this, this makes sense. But um, as we know that, you know, it's having a genome and having annotated genes is one thing. Um, you want to have some proof that it actually does does those uh, has activity that it, the genome has, and having a grown or organism cultured in the lab is uh, the best combination you can have. So to to be able to have strong inference, you got to have the sequenced genome, and you got to have the organism in the lab. So this is where like the, the, the True power of having access to an HPLC is very helpful for characterizing the new microbes. So I know that it, it likes fumarate, so I can uh, grow cultures with fumarate, and then over time, taking samples and monitor the consumption of fumarate as it, uh, is, uh, as the organism grows. I can combine that with cell density, watching the you know, numbers of the cell go up, and then also looking at end products that are being produced in uh, uh, secreted from the organism, in this case, acetate and succinate. And so I was using an ROA uh, column on a, on a, on a uh, HPLC with a uh, 5 millimolar sulfuric acid, I believe. And, and so in this case, I was able to easily, readily access and track the metabolism of this microbe and confirm the genes that were seen or identified within the genome. With that closed uh, genome of DRI-13, we start also discovering some new things. So one is we have found some embedded prophages. So uh, about four uh, viruses had infected DRI-13 and seemingly not kill it, and they became archived within the genome. And so that was uh, definitely very interesting. And actually, these viruses are novel. They're, uh, they had not been uh, seen before. But Having the closed genome, having the nanopore data, also gave us some, uh, another part of uh, kind of a, the puzzle or a, a bit of information, which is the methylome. And so we noticed that this particular bacterium has uh, seemingly a very robust methylation scheme to defend itself. And so while not necessarily metabolism related, like the methylation can also be tracked by, or at least assisted by using an HPLC. 
so I wanted to give a, talk just a little bit of background on the, the, the methylation scheme. I also want to also give kind of a, a, a shout out to my two uh, students, uh, Trevor Murphy and uh, Ray Zhao, uh, who um, did this work. And um, what we're finding that, like, uh, if you look at the genome, there's you know predicted uh, motifs, and you can say, okay, it should have this this amount of methylation. And then when we use the actually analyze the nanoport, and we say, well, no, really, we have this amount of methylation. And DR13 uh, kind of gave, you know, it was very interesting uh, looking at it and like, okay, it's not behaving as we expected. So this is kind of where we kind of started and said, okay, we maybe we should look at this a little a uh, little deeper into this organism. And yeah, here, actually, yeah, here's a picture of Trevor and Ray. Um, so what we found is that in this particular mi microorganism, they're using a different motif for their methylation scheme. So this is what, why there's kind of a disconnect between the predicted number of methylations and the actual observed uh, methylation um, uh, within the organism through nanopore. What we plan to do now is that we can take the genome and digest it, and then we can run the nucleotide, the complete digest it, and run the nucleotides, and we can actually get um, empirical direct observation of the nucleotides and, and the percentage thereof of being methylated. And uh, using a, a, a biphenyl uh, a column, this can be done, uh, and uh, again, another uh, tool uh, within the, um, using an HPLC for characterizing uh, novel microbes and, and microbes that are also doing very odd and strange things, at least uh, not uh, according to the current knowledge base of, uh, of prokaryotes. Okay, so um, for that for right now, that's what I was going to talk about with DR13, and now I want to talk about a new organism that we're working with right now. And again, we are using HPLC very heavily to try to characterize this organism. This organism came from BLM1, so this is the other borehole uh, in this uh, study site. Again, um, I don't want to go into too much detail regarding the environment uh, which this organism came from, but it is a deep subsurface environment, um, you know, over 500 meters uh, underground, um, oligotrophic, um, geothermally heated. Um, the rock is uh, dolomite and, uh, and other uh, materials. And um, this is a project when we're working with NASA where we're dangling little sponges on strings uh, underground and letting the microbes uh, in, uh, infuse themselves into the sponge and then re we would reel the samples back. Um, they, it's one of those things when I teach them in class, it feels like you know, the, the dirtiest thing in your household is the sponge you know, in your kitchen. And uh, while that sounds very gross, and light, it's actually a really cool thing. Sponges are very handy for collecting microbes. So um, this is uh, work that will be published very soon, but this, the organism that we uh, grew and enriched from BLM1, um, we gave it the strain name SIC1, and to our great and surprise and also uh, very pleased is that this one um, belonged to uh, a candidate phylum called OP9. And so we've we got it growing in the lab, we were able to characterize it and you know, sequence the 16S, and so this is a novel phylum, and so uh, definitely a, a, a very fun honor to be able to uh, work with this organism. I'll talk a little bit about its name, it, 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 it was very kind of special trying to give this thing a name, but um, here's a, a 16S of phylogenetic trees is to show that definitely it, it, it's found squarely within the phylum OP9 and it, within the domain bacteria. So similarly like uh, DRI-13, we uh, started growing the microbe. We found a way to re, uh, reliably grow it in the lab and so we used an HPLC to start tracking the metabolism. The, um, the consumption of the uh, substrate and the production of uh, uh, end products. So in this case, this particular microbe had a penchant for uh, xylitol. So the artificial sweetener, typically in gum, um, most microbes can't use it, but this one does. And this is a subsurface microbe. 
I have no idea why it likes Lyle Talpa, so that's part of the mystery of what we are uh, will be publishing on and trying to figure out the genomic background and uh, why you know how does it all fit together for the subsurface. But again, using an ROA a column, a Shimazu a prominence eye uh, instrument, we're able to start tracking uh, the the disappearance of xylitol and then. Um, and also characterizing the production of um, new products. So um, you're dealing with new organisms, so it's always, um, I always tell my students that, you know, be prepared for strain. Sometimes new stuff will happen and you, you know, you have to start following the breadcrumbs, uh, kind of like uh, solving a mystery of where it takes you. So, Again, yeah, well, using the HPLC is a very powerful tool. We can watch the consumption of xylitol from 10 millimolar down to 5 millimolar. And, you know, we have standards. So, okay, yeah, acetate is being produced. Great. And then we have uh, a mystery peak pops up. No idea uh, what this is. It is tied to the metabolism, so it only appears when xylitol is being uh, metabolized. Um, it changes in the height when, when you change the, uh, the production or the time when, when you sample. So while uh, in this case, you know, HLC is still very powerful. It helps identifying uh, the metabolism of uh, new and unusual microbes that that now I, I am faced with a new challenge and I have to probably uh, get my hands on a mass spec and collect a sample and then, or even do a, a whole cell extract and start trying to uh, uh, isolate this peak and finding out what it is. And, but uh, for me, uh, and, and working with uh, new and unusual microbes, this is, uh, this is part of the fun. And also with my students, who uh, get to learn, they get to use the instruments, they get to um, solve the puzzle, and it's very rewarding in that sense as well. So um, I, uh, I mentioned about the name. So, you know, uh, discovering new microbes, that means we get to uh, name, uh, provide the name, uh, get a check out for the Greek and Latin on it. But I want to give a shout out to my team here. And actually, there are more people uh, involved here, but the initial uh, discoverer is Amanda Blocker. And uh, Aaron, John, and Katie, and Trevor have all uh, pitched in to uh, help uh, make this paper uh, come, to, uh, come into being. And, and now we're at the stage now that we're getting ready to publish. Um, so, but the name itself, it's called the Atribacterium Inframons, and, you know, translated loosely, it's a mysterious uh, hot rod that loves the underworld, or if you kind of mess with the wording a little bit, it, it can be um, the mysterious hot lover from the underworld. Either way, this is a significant uh, discovery for my lab, and, uh, we, uh, and I'm very thankful for my students who put in the hours and work with this, uh, work with these organisms, and even when the organisms don't always behave or, or do things as planned. But again, they're part of the, the dark matter, the unknowns out there, so um, it's, uh, it's fun stuff. And um, uh, thank you for uh, sitting in on my talk. And uh, here's uh, again, uh, a listing of uh, the people in my lab, uh, current and uh, those that have graduated and uh, my collaborators. Um, again, I'm used to developing uh, talks as I go and I, I want to uh, uh, I can at least acknowledge to my work at DRI. Um, a lot of this I couldn't have done if it wasn't for the mentorship and direction from Dr. Dwayne Moser. And um, but you know my funding sources are from SIU, NASA, uh, DRI, um, and, uh, and also just um, uh, uh, scholarships and work, uh, and other grants that uh, students have won uh, as well. But um, anyway, I will entertain questions. Uh, um, and I, again, I hope you enjoyed this little snippet, this little look into subsurface microbes, and uh, and trying to figure out what they're what they're doing and, and how they're doing it. Let's thank Scott for such an exciting presentation. Again, under the resource list, you can find more information about our analytical solutions. If you have not had a chance, please fill out the survey questions on the right-hand side to provide feedback and request additional information. 
This is our final live webinar of the 2021 Analytical Extravaganza Series. We encourage you and your colleagues to view our recorded webinars, which encompass a wide variety of application areas. The registration link is located at the bottom of this slide. At this time, we're going to begin our live Q&A session. Um, we have some questions rolling in from the audience. The first couple are going to be more analytically based, and then we'll go into some more um, applications based. In your laboratory on your HPLC, are you using just refractive index detection, or are you doing refractive index and UV? Um, a good question. Yeah, I'm using both, but I mean, basically, I have to adapt the detector to whatever I'm trying to. Uh, analyze. So I'm using whatever detector is giving me the best, most sensitive uh, detection of the uh, target molecule. Okay. And the next two are sort of related. Um, what is your opinion on how mass spec would help in your research? Um, well, in the case of the unknown, I'm, I've, <laughs> I've already gone through a, a fairly in-depth list of uh, possible candidates, and none of them are matching. And you know, even going through, you know, was that is this a false positive from something from the media or whatever? And so right now, I'm I'm kind of running out of options. So I'm you know, if I bring in a mass spec, um, maybe I can get at least get a, a a mass on the item, and I can try to figure out what are my possibilities. So uh, yeah, I, it, again, it's just kind of a fun situation, but I, I need a clue right now. A, a peak on HPLC is great, but I need a little more information. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt in your, your environment, you're working with very, very different novel compounds. The next question was more of a comment, but it would be cool to use a high-res LCMS to look at the pore water because a high-res would allow yeah. you to, to look at more things and help identify them. Yeah. Now, the thing is, like, with the pore water, um, so, again, like, the limitation of actually having access, sometimes um, we literally can only send down a baler and get a liter's worth of water. Or, um, you know, if we're lucky, we can get a pump that actually pump the liquid in. But then you run the risk of actually introducing contaminants. Now the surface microbes have a chance to invade these environments, and then it starts corrupting your, uh, the results you get on it. So it's, um, it, it's a fine, I don't know, not a fine line, but it's that you, you really are balancing trying to get a pure sample un uh, uh, unaltered by the surface world and then being confident what, what you're reading is, is accurate and true. Mm. Um, our next question is, any projection on how the rest of the microbe, the 90% to B% percent microbiome will be tackled? Um, I guess uh, in the sense of uh, characterization or like, I mean, because I guess let me, yeah, I think I actually understand the question. So the thing is, is that right now we, you know, we can only grow a certain amount of them in the lab, and I'm sure through sequencing we can, you know, do some damage and maybe get another 50%. But then the question is always left, is like, what other, of the ones that we don't have or haven't detected, do they matter? Are the minor populations just important as the major population? And and so forth. So, I mean, it's very, um, I, I, I kind of, Go from the point of view that what we don't know is just as important as what we do know to understand the full picture. So, yeah, we probably will have to start uh, culturing and sequencing the rest. Maybe uh, as far as the culturing, uh, there's uh, issues of the, the methods. Maybe uh, certain uh, minute amounts of trace nutrients or, uh, you know, there, there's, there's always new techniques we should be employing because the loose pasture techniques, all the stuff we do for E. coli, uh, that's great and all, but um, a lot, the one thing these subsurface microbes have taught me is that you really have to uh, pay attention to the nuances. The little things matter a lot. Uh, the water example I made is, is a perfect example. I never, re I never knew so much about water until after working with these, with these microorganisms. No doubt. Um, uh, your colleague from UGA, Angela Snow, says, hi, Scott, and she says, is the goal of your project just to identify novel microbes, or are you trying to isolate the most representative or common microbes in that environment, and how do you remove biases due to culturing techniques? Uh, hi, hi, Angela. Yeah, I saw, I saw you're in the list there, so, this, you know, it's good. Um, well, 
I would say in the case of like DRI 13 and SIUC1, they are not the major populations in these environments. So that's kind of a strange thing. Yeah, we can grow some of the major uh, populations, and usually they are the ones that have already been characterized, you know, uh, methanothermal autotrophicum or, you know, stuff like that. So these are actually minor population microbes. Now, in a sense, I, I can't at this point. Like, um, I can't be picky. I we we try a regimen of uh, substrates or or techniques to grow microbes, and literally go with what falls out of the sky. Uh, and usually, I would say probably thirty percent of the time, it's stuff we already know. But because of the techniques are kind of the filter, we start ending up with strange stuff. Like the xylitol. To be honest, I would not have suspected that would have worked. Um, but that was a suggestion by uh, one of my undergrads. Like, why don't we try xylitol? I'm like, okay, go ahead and try it. You know, um, and as far as removing biases and all that, uh, you know, this, they are still uh, extremophiles. They're, they're thermophiles. So at the high temperature, um, at 65 degrees or greater, they um, that that alone also filters out a lot of uh, contaminants and uh, surface microbes. Does if you're not a thermophile, you're not going to survive those temperatures. So that's probably filter number one. And then the other filters behind that, the uh, reduced uh, environment, the substrate. I usually make my media very lean. I, I do not like to use uh, yeast extract. I do not like to use any type of uh, uncharacterized um, uh, uh, nutrient sources. I, I, I keep it very lean. And also, I'm trying to reflect the environment. It's very lean down there, so um, trying to keep them happy as much as possible. Yep, it makes sense. Um, next question: Have you been able to analyze the water for metals or organometallics to see if these bacteria are playing a role in the hydrothermal alteration of the rocks? Um, uh, another part of the team was doing uh, metal analysis in the water, and I think the answer is yes. Actually, a paper was just uh, published recently, a couple months ago, where um, they were sending down uh, metal uh, bits and different substrates and then uh, looking for alterations. Um, one, I think one of the, the pictures they have in their paper um, was showing a, a microbe attached or pro either attached or producing like an iron, pi uh, iron uh, sulfur uh, granule, and basically they were making pyrite. So, Part of the metabolism, yeah, they are altering, they are changing things down there. They have to get their electrons from someplace. So they're either, you know, using uh, um, iron or sulfide um, uh, or even methane. You know, so that, that's part of the mystery, though. It's like, you know, trying to get a very um, closed, dynamic look at the subsurface and seeing who's cross-feeding who, where is the primary energy source and so forth. Um, there are papers out there, like the Shivian et al. paper of the sulfurous autox vitus, suggesting that radionuclides uh, or uh, radiolysis from uh, uranium uh, can generate enough hydrogen to support uh, a microbe. Um, so th there's stuff like that, you know, really kind of bizarre things, but that's an example where we're just trying to balance the checkbook to understand how does this massive, diverse uh, microbial subsurface uh, life sustain themselves. And, and like I said, it's not a complete clear picture. Yeah, yeah, it's very complex, lots of, of facets to the whole project. The next question sort of ties into that. What is the dominant food source? Is it organics in the dolomite or limestone? And how do they respire? Um, the, well, in the case of the, the sites that these two come from, there I actually took some of the, the limestone, the dolomite, ground it up. I even took uh, concentrated water. Uh, waters and all that. I could not find fumarate. I could not find xylitol. So, what I'm growing them on are n presumably not the things that they're growing on in the environment. Now, they, with like fumarate, I can make the argument that this is being cross-fed from another microbe. So, this uh, DR13 is a mop-up organism, and then when they start uh, respiring um, uh, hydrogen. Um, after eating fumarate, the hydrogen can be definitely used by another microbe. So that kind of makes sense. With SIUC1, I'm not, again, I'm not terribly sure how the xylitol fits in it, but it, it seems to like other sugars. So at least it's not so narrow that it's only xylitol. But now the question is, okay, is there a, a large source of uh, sugars down there? Ebotically, probably not. Um, so again, the sugars are probably coming from other organisms. So I, if I, you know, again, we're trying to 
build up the repertoire of microbes from the subsurfaces right now. It's, uh, there's a dearth of it. There's not many to work with. But I can imagine that you have a foundation of primary producers, chemolithoautotrophs, which are using energy from hydrogen or methane, and they're fixing CO2, they're making sugars, they're making proteins, they die, they either exude this, and then the other microbes being heterotrophs, picking stuff up, and then you have the, 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 the cleanup crews that are recycling this, and this is how they're, they're living down there. And then they have to do this probably at a very slow rate, so this is where um, a lot of times it's said, um, the life in the subsurface is life in the slow lane. Um, there's viruses down there, so they have to protect themselves from predation. Um, it, it, like I said, it's not a straightforward thing, but it's very fascinating. And, and to be honest, you know, you look down in the deep, you're dealing with water, hydrogen, you know, heat and all this. Separate from the sun on the surface, you don't have to be on Earth anymore. You, you could be in Mars or some other planet. I mean, so it's very important to study these subsurface microbes because they're doing things um, very differently from what we take for granted here on the surface. No doubt. That is so, so interesting. Very fascinating work indeed. But it looks like we don't have any more questions, so I, I want to thank everyone for the interesting questions that were submitted. And once again, thank you everyone for attending and participating. We'll send you an email with a link to view a recorded version of this presentation anytime. And we encourage you and your colleagues to attend our recorded webinars. And the registration link is located at the bottom of this slide. Thank you so much again and have a wonderful day.